Okay, so in theory, Zoom should be able to see my screen. Testing, testing, that one. Um, so I'm unmuted, is that correct? Okay. Maybe it's just the the mic plus me standing here that's doing it. Maybe if I stand over here, is that better? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Well, good morning, everyone. Um, it's a pleasure to be here today um, to talk to you all about um, one of my favorite classes of um, X ray saw. Um, and that is active galactic nuclei, or AGN. Um, now, there's more than enough about AGN to fill an entire lecture course. Um, we could talk about AGN from the perspective of many different wavelengths, at which we see many different phenomena. But today, I'm going to focus primarily on what we can see in AGN with X-ray observations. Um, and out of that, um, you're probably going to, I'll warn you that I'm probably, you're probably going to end up seeing this topic through my, my biases as to what I thought was the most interesting to fit into the space of about 45 minutes. So this is by no means everything we can talk about with AGM. So first of all, what is an AGM? Well, an AGM or active galactic nucleus is when the supermassive black hole in the center of a galaxy is accreting material. So we've got material falling into that black hole. And as the material falls into the black hole, the gravitational energy is being released. And the energy that is being released is enough to power some of the brightest light sources we see in our universe. In fact, if we ignore explosive phenomena, things like supernova, gamma ray bursts, transient events, if we just think about the static light sources, in our night sky. AGN are the brightest continuous sources of electromagnetic radiation that we know about. So typically, the supermassive black hole in the center of a galaxy, or at least a major galaxy, not a dwarf galaxy, will be somewhere between a million and a billion solar mass. And as we can see, and as we can see in the picture of this AGN, this is a super galaxy called a Messier 106, and we'll come back to what that means. The whole center of this galaxy is producing a light source that's bright enough to outshine all of the stars in that galaxy. So this is something like a luminosity of 10 to the 11 times the solar luminosity coming out of a volume of space that's around the size of a solar system. Now, I think one of the most amazing achievements in the realm of AGN and supermassive black holes over the last couple of years has been the Event Horizon Telescope. It's been made right in on the supermassive black holes, both in our own galaxy, in Sagittarius A star, and in the AGN M87, we zoom right in on that black hole, where we can see this ring of hot gas that's in orbit around the black hole. And here, this is glowing, it's sub millimeter wavelengths, so wavelengths but that's a little bit shorter than radio. But we can see in this image, this is a size scale of micro arc seconds on our sky, about 50 micro arc seconds. We can see the dark shadow in the middle of that ring. And the dark shadow in the middle of that ring represents the black hole. And the event horizon of that black hole, that's a region of space around the black hole where the gravitational field is so strong that nothing can escape not even light. As well as producing these incredible luminosities, AGM do a whole range of other amazing things. But this is the AGM that first got me hooked on studying these objects. This is a radio image of an AGM called Sigma Z. If we looked at the optical image of this galaxy, all we'd see is a small galaxy around that bright point in the center of the radio image. But when we look in the radio, we see that the supermassive black hole in the center of this galaxy is shooting out these enormous jets traveling at almost the speed of light. So we're talking 99.9% .9 plus 
of the speed of light. These jets travel far out of the galaxy and they slam into the gas that's surrounding the galaxy. They deposit their energy into that gas and they inflate these beautiful radio lobes. And we can see here the bright spots at the end of the lobes where that jet is interacting with the gas and it's depositing its energy into the gas. To this day, we don't fully understand how black holes are able to launch jets, but we think it's got something to do with magnetic fields, where the field lines end up threading through the event horizon of the black hole. And when we have a magnetic field passing through the event horizon of the black hole, we have an additional source of energy available to us, as well as the gravitational energy of the material falling in. There's a process known as the Blanford's Nyack process, where a magnetic field passes through the event horizon of a black hole. If the black hole is spinning, it's able to actually extract energy from the rotation of the black hole. So the angular momentum and the rotational energy of the black hole we're able to extract along the magnetic field. And we believe that that's the energy source that's powering these impressive jets and galaxies such as Sigma Zero. An AGM are absolutely everywhere in our universe. So this is, I think, the clearest, highest resolution image of the entire X-ray sky. This was released a few years ago by Ivo Zika. This is the entire sky in the next moment. We can see, we can see in the center of this image, we can see the galactic plane. There's a lot of obscuration from dust in our galaxy, but we can see a lot of X-ray sources through the galaxy. And these are predominantly X-ray binaries that Jack's going to talk about later. But then if we look out of the galactic plane, if we look up here and down here, we see the X-ray sky is filled with these point sources. Pretty much every one of these point sources is an AGM. Supermassive black hole in another galaxy that's producing these bright light sources. And it's not just those AGM that we can see as point sources. As Matteo alluded to a couple of days ago, there are many, many more AGM that we can't see. Whether that's because they're too far away for us to resolve with the telescope, or because they're hidden behind optically thick gas, what we call obscured AGM. Those AGM that we can't see individually are still producing X-ray X-ray emission that contributes to this signal that we call the cosmic X-ray background, that is predominantly made up of the emission of many, many AGM across the universe. And if we just do some simple back of the envelope calculations, if we calculate the total amount of energy that's coming out of this supermassive black hole, we add up the energy that's coming out in the electromagnetic radiation, and also the kinetic energy in the jets and kinetic energy in other material gets pushed out from the center of these AGM. We find that actually that total energy output of the AGM is either comparable to, or in many cases more than, the total gravitational binding energy that's holding the stars in a galaxy together. So on the face of it, it sounds like if we took all of the energy that was coming out of an AGM and we could share it equally among the stars in the galaxy, we could potentially blow that galaxy apart. Of course, the real world is a little more subtle. We know the galaxies don't get blown apart by AGM. But what this, this equation is telling us, this balance of energy is telling us, that if we've got a supermassive black hole in the center of the galaxy, if that supermassive black hole is growing by material falling into it, energy is being released through radiation, through jets, through winds, and other outflows. The black hole's growing, so the black hole grows more, more and more energy comes out. And then that energy coming out is enough to push away the stars in the galaxy, or it's enough to push away the gas that would fall into the galaxy and form stars. This is telling us that AGM aren't just these astronomical ornaments, these curiosities, but they must have played an important role in the growth of galaxies and the growth of the structure in the universe that we see. And we'll come back to this topic at the end of today. Well. This is a process that we call AGM feedback. 
But there's a lot that we don't know about AGM. I mean, we've got some questions. So we've got this picture that there's this gas falling into black hole that's releasing energy and powering some of the brightest light towards us in our universe. But how exactly does it do it? How is energy released from material falling into a supermassive black hole to power some of the brightest objects in our universe? How is that energy output moderated over time? How do AGM switch on and switch off? And a related question, how did these supermassive black holes grow over the history of our universe? And how did that growth of the supermassive black hole influence the growth of the host galaxy and the growth of the structure we see in our universe? How do those jets work? Why is it only some supermassive black holes or jets while others don't? And we think general relativity is the best description we have of gravity. It's general relativity that predicted the existence of black holes to begin with. Well, actually, there were some interior arguments that we used in the 19th century to predict black holes. But the first proof theory of a black hole came out of general relativity. But is general relativity when we're talking about these extreme gravitational fields right outside a black hole? And these are some of the big questions that we can hope to tackle by studying and observing AGM. So here's a brief outline of what I'm going to talk about both today and tomorrow. So today I'm going to say at a very high level, that I'm going to touch on quite a broad range of phenomenology associated with AGM, different components of an AGM and how we can observe them, and particularly how we can observe them in the X-ray background. And hopefully for those of you who are working on X-ray observations of AGM, both in this workshop and in the future, this will give you some ideas of what to look for in your data and how to interpret that in terms of the structure of the AGM. So we're going to talk about the attrition disk, that's the gas that's falling into the black hole. We're going to talk about this thing we call the corona. The corona is another object in the black hole. In a red around black hole, but it's just like a jet, we don't fully really understand where it comes from, but we know it must be there. This corona is what's producing the X ray emission that we're able to observe. In fact, without that corona, we probably wouldn't be having this X ray workshop talk on AGM at all. And then we'll talk a little bit about winds and outflows, how accretion of supermassive black holes not only pulls material in, but it's able to blow material out as well. And then at the end of today's lecture, we'll talk a little bit more about that feedback process. Uh, just a few little bits of evidence we can see, um, see there. And then tomorrow, I'm going to jump into more detail. And we're going to talk about some more specifics about how we can really get close to that black hole with x ray observations, how we can measure what's happening right outside the event horizon, how we can measure some of the fundamental properties of the black hole and the corona. And how we can start to understand how supermassive black holes form in the first place. So, AGM come in all different shapes and sizes. And depending on how they look, mostly as optical wavelengths, but also at other wavelengths, um, we tend to give them different names. So, these are just some of the names you might find associated with AGM, but it might be helpful to. To talk about. Um, and the ones that, that we talk about a lot in the X-ray band are these objects called C foot galaxies. There are two types, C foot one and C foot two. And a C foot galaxy is when we look at the optical image, it looks like a spiral galaxy, but we see this bright nucleus in the center, powered by the supermassive black hole. And these are a couple of the most famous examples. Um, there's a CFET type 1 galaxy, and we'll come back to what type 1 and 2 mean in a little bit. Um, this is um, a rather nice picture of a um, Hubble Space Telescope image of the galaxy called NGC 451. We can see the bright nucleus in the center of the spiral. Um, and then this is one of the most famous CFET 2s. This is called the Circulus Galaxy. Um, the CFET 2s are often, um, the nucleus is a little more obscured. You can see it's a little more hazy down the center. We can still see this spiral structure. And this uh, this right AGM at the center. 
Then we have the radio galaxies, uh, the radio galaxies, so called because they were first discovered in radio telescopes. And these are the ones where we see these extended sources of radio emission that we attribute to the jets. And a couple of the most famous of these, uh, this is N87, where the event horizon telescope zoomed in right on the black hole in the center. This is a giant elliptical galaxy where we can see this jet shooting out of the side. Um, and we see this jet not just at radio wavelengths, but we can also see it in the optical and the X ray. And this is a radio galaxy called Centaurus F. Again, we've got that galaxy in the center, those jets coming out the side, and those lobes as the jets in flat in the environment. And if our eyes could see a radio wavelength, actually Centaurus A on the sky would appear bigger than the full moon. That's how big these jets are. We then have this class of AGM called blazars. Blazars are extremely bright, extremely variable AGM, um, where we see an, an optical spectrum that looks quite flat and quite featureless, an X-ray spectrum that looks quite flat and quite featureless, and they vary very rapidly in time. And in a blazon, we can't really see much else. We can't see much of a host galaxy. We just see this bright light. And a blazon is when, uh, so in this radio galaxy, we're looking at the jet from the sun. A blazon is when we're looking at the jet from the end. So the jet is pointing right towards us, and it's firing all of its emissions towards us, which means it's very difficult to see anything else. We're just seeing that jet coming straight towards us. And then I'll come on to this, this last term here, a quasar or QSO. And now quasar has to be one of the worst defined terms in all the time. Different people mean different things by quasar. Um, the historic origins of the word quasar actually kind of traces us back to the 1960s. It was an abbreviation for quasar stellar radio source. And this is when people were first doing radio surveys of the sun. They saw these bright sources of radio. And then when they, they looked with their optical telescopes, they saw what looked like a bright star. But then when they estimated the distance to that star, they realized it was much, much, much too bright to be a star. It was the optical emission from the, the AGM. Mm -hmm. um, so historically, quasar means it is radio source with a brighter point source for this. Um, but these days, we also have radio quiet quasars. So how can you have a radio quiet quasar scale of radio source? Um, it's just a, a word that's kind of lost its meaning. But, but often what we mean by a quasar is today is some of the brightest things. In particular, we will define a quasar in optical wavelengths when the, the central AGM is so bright that it's swamping <laughs> out the view of our host galaxy. So in these secret galaxies, these spiral galaxies and the bright nucleus, in these quasars, we're just seeing the bright nucleus and we're not able to see the structure of the, the host galaxy. So over the next few slides, um, I just want to build up kind of a cartoon picture of the structure that we, we think we have around that black hole in the center of an AGM. And of course, the fundamental feature of the AGM is the supermassive black hole in the center of the galaxy. By supermassive, we normally mean a black hole somewhere between 10 to the 6 and 10 to the 9, 10 to the 10 solar masses. Um, you might also include a little bit smaller black holes, maybe around 10 to the 5 solar masses. Um, but um, some people count those as supermassive, some people count them as kind of intermediate masses. Um, but the, the fundamental features of a black hole, um, the black hole itself is actually quite boring as far as we're concerned, looking at it from the outside. Uh, general relativity lets us derive something called the no-hair theory. And what the no-hair theory tells us is that a black hole can only be described by a maximum of three properties. A black hole has a mass, a black hole has a spin or an angular momentum, and in theory, a black hole can also have an electric but in the real universe, you don't expect to see black holes with electrical charges. Because if you had a black hole that had a negative charge, it would probably just pull in positive charges from its environment and it would neutralize that charge. So in practice, even though there are these three properties, 
we talk about black holes as just being described by two fundamental properties, the mass and the spin. And then any other property of the gas that fell into the black hole ends up getting lost, either because it's hidden inside the event horizon and we can't see it, or as the black hole formed, and it um, radiates both electromagnetic radiation and gravitational waves. Any other properties of the material that falls into the black hole get radiated away with radiating the gravitational waves. So all we're left with are mass and the spin. To power our AGM, we also need gas to fall into our black hole. And following the rules of uh, conservation of angular momentum, we typically expect that gas around the black hole to flatten into what we call an accretion disk. So the idea is you have this flat disk of gas around the black hole. At any given radius in the black in the disk, the gas is in a stable circular orbit, just following Kepler's laws in orbit around the black hole. But over time, that gas loses its angular momentum, and that causes it to slowly spiral inwards. It's down to the orbit, and it's slowly spiraling inwards, traveling in through the disk. And as it falls inwards, the gravitational energy gets converted into kinetic energy, and then that kinetic energy gets dissipated in various ways, and that's what's producing the energy output that we can see. When we talk about space around a black hole, we often don't talk about distances in terms of meters in physical units that we're used to, but we write down our distance in terms of this grade unit for the gravitational radius. It turns out that if we measure our distance in units of gm divided by c squared, where m is the mass of the black hole we're talking about, g is Newton's gravitational constant, c is the speed of light. It turns out that we can use the same distance scale to describe a black hole of any size, at least when we're talking about the properties of the gravitational field. So for different masses of black holes, for a 10 solar mass stellar, for a stellar mass black hole of 10 solar masses, you can calculate this distance on G. Or for a million solar mass supermass black hole, you can calculate this distance. But at the same distance in these units, so we say a distance of two gravitational radii or six gravitational radii, no matter what the mass of the black hole is, the space time has the same property. So this gives us this really convenient way to convert between um, modeling stellar mass black holes, small supermassive black holes, and the biggest supermassive black holes. And then we measure the spin of the black hole in terms of this thing called the spin parameter. Um, there's no need to worry too much about exactly what this spin parameter is today. Essentially, it's the angular momentum of the black hole divided by the mass of the black hole times the speed of light. Um, and then if we convert this, um, this spin parameter, J over MC, into those units again of GM over C squared, we end up with a dimensionless number. And this number can run between zero and one. A spin of zero is a black hole that's not rotating. And a spin of one is a black hole that is rotating at the absolute maximum speed that it's about. The defining feature of that black hole is the event horizon. And the event horizon is this, this surface around the black hole at which the gravitational field becomes so strong that nothing can escape. So the event horizon isn't the solid surface, it's not the material in the black hole. The material in the black hole is compressed right down at the center. Gravity just keeps pulling it together. But the event horizon is the region around the black hole where the gravitational field becomes so strong that once you go into it, you can't escape. And no light can escape from inside that event horizon either. So, as far as we're concerned in the observable universe, that event horizon is empty right now, and that you can't see anything inside. If the black hole isn't spinning, this event horizon is at the radius of two times RG. Two times RG is also called the Starkfield radius. Can any of you have heard that term? So Starkfield radius is two to the end of square. It's uh, the radius of a non spinning also known as a Starkfield black hole. But then as the black hole spins faster, the event horizon actually breaks. 
and actually in the field of the universe, you spin up a black hole by putting energy on the next thing to it. But as you spin up a black hole, it becomes harder and harder to spin it faster. So we actually don't think we can get to a spin planet with one. We think the maximum spin planet you can get to is somewhere around 0.99. And it's a spin of 0.998, and that same as I did one who comes with a lot of electrical black hole physicists. Um, but we won't go into that today. Um, but for our purposes, if the spin of the black hole increases to the maximum value of 0.998, this event horizon goes to 2RG with 1RG. General relativity also changes the laws of motion around the black hole compared to usual laws. In Newton's laws of gravity, we can say in orbit and any radius of black hole, just as long as we're traveling fast enough, we can say in orbit as close to an object as we like. In general relativity, that's not true. When we get to this radius that we call the innermost stable circular orbit, or the ISO, I S C O, the gravitational field overwhelms you. So no matter how fast you try to travel, remembering that we can't travel fast enough to speed of light, we can't maintain that stable circular orbit. So once we're inside this stable circular orbit, then the only orbit you can go on to, but there are orbits you can go on to, kind of the natural orbit you can fall on to is plunging orbit where you can fall in. So a non-spinning black hole, actually this, this is going, is quite the biggest the black holes. The event horizon is at two RG, but the ISCO is at six RG. There's this big space between the event horizon and the ISCO where things fall in. And what that means for our accretion disk is that our accretion disk can only stay spiraling round until it gets to that ISCO. Once our material gets to that ISCO, it can't spiral anymore, it can't go round. So what will happen is the material will go from the outer disk, it will get to this ISCO. And then if it loses any more momentum, then it just falls very quickly. And what that means for our disk is um, because it goes from falling in quite slowly to plunging in very quickly, the velocity increases, that means to conserve the mass in the disk, the density of the disk has to drop. So we kind of draw this in a cartoon as our accretion disk having this hole in it. It's not really a hole, there is gas still there, but just the density drops quite quickly. Because of the material falling into the black hole. Yes. So can I ask a question? Yes, please do. Um, so is the event horizon where, so if you're outside of the event horizon, a light still escape? Or, um, yeah, right. And, and um, with respect to the ISO as well, if you're within the ISO, can a light still escape? Yes, it can. So, um, so yes, um, if you're inside the ISCO, you don't have to fall. There are helps you can take. You can travel. If you've got the means to get your velocity high enough, you can fly out. So we can see light coming from inside the ISCO. And we'll talk more about this in tomorrow's lecture. But one of the things that actually happens is because the gas inside the ISCO is falling inwards so quickly, we actually end up with relativistic beaming where material falling into black hole emits most of its light in its forward direction travel so it will actually send most of the light it tries to emit into the black hole so in practice we don't see a lot of light inside the but in, in theory um any to do have gas falling in somehow a, a little bit of light that comes out of the back that would be able to see and yes so a black hole spins faster Actually, because when a black hole spins, that makes the space around the black hole spin with it. It's still effect called frame dragging. Space around the black hole is dragged into motion by the black hole. It's kind of like if you're trying to orbit on this rotating space, it's almost like running on a fender. And actually, that helps you stay in orbit because the space is moving around. It actually helps you move around as well. So if black hole is spinning, you can actually stay in orbit much closer to the black hole than you would be able to otherwise. So the next thing we have is the corona. The corona is what produces the X-ray emitter that we can observe with our X-ray telescopes. We don't fully understand what this corona is, but it's a region of particles 
very close to the black hole in a compact region that are getting accelerated to high energies. The kind of cartoon picture, and we'll come back to this in a little bit, is that we have magnetic fields similar to the kinds of magnetic fields that can form jets that are getting twisted around by the black hole spinning, twisted around by the gas disk going around. And this twisting together of magnetic fields ends up dissipating energy and heating and accelerating particles here. These high energy particles then go on to produce the X ray continuum of the galaxy. And actually, some of these X rays in the corona shine down onto the quickly disk and reflect. And that's another thing that we're very good to see. And we'll come back to that. Then we have the jets. But only some supermassive black holes are able to launch these jets. We don't fully understand why. But we think it's got something to do with magnetic fields. Magnetic field lines that end up running through a spinning black hole end up getting put out and put open into these long columns of magnetic fields that material can be ejected along. And then, as I said earlier, those magnetic field lines can extract the energy from the spin of the black hole and have a almost jet. We don't talk a lot about the jets at X ray wavelengths. A lot of the emission we see from um, from jets in um, from the radio, uh, see the flow emission from the um, electrons moving around the, the magnetic field. Um, we see little bits of X-ray emission from jets. Um, we see gamma ray emission from jets. We see optical emission from jets as well. Um, but I'm not going to talk a huge amount about jets in this lectures, um, just because then um, it's not generally a big study, a big study or a big focus of the, the X-ray studies. Yes. So the can the corona be the base yeah. Good question. Um yes. Um actually I've got a slide on this in, in a little bit, but, but yes, one of the ideas for the corona is it, it could be the base of the jet and just the part of acceleration the base of the jet into the, the X-ray ocean. So zooming out from our crucial list. There's then this structure that's often referred to as a torus. So the idea is we have this thin accretion disk around the black hole, but then outside of that accretion disk, we have this thicker donut of gas that then surrounds the central regions. And, the, and this torus has a couple of different effects. Um, so if we are looking at the black hole from sort of somewhere up here, and we're looking down in this direction, then we can see this porous, um, and we can see the X-rays from the corona reflecting off the surface of the porous. But it doesn't really cause a big problem for us looking at central regions. However, if we try and look at the black hole from over here, this porous actually gets in our way. So we don't see the corona, and we don't see the accretion this. All we see is the absorbed, we see these X-rays absorbed as they pass through this torus. And this torus, we think, is the origin of the infrared energy in energy. So this, this torus is absorbing the radiation of the center, whether well, that's the X-ray energy from the corona or the optical UV energy from this, and then it's re radiates that in the infrared. The torus is this nice simple thing that I've brought here, evidence is that clumps, clouds of gas. And then beyond the torus, we then have this whole other population of clump of gas around the central white hole. And um, we mostly see this if we look at optical spectra of AGM. Um, and, and the idea is we sort of have all of this clump of gas. It could just be gas trapped in orbit around the black hole, or it could be gas that's outflowing. So gas that evaporates off the surface of the disk, it evaporates off the surface of the forest. When we kind of think about this gas as being in kind of two regions, we have the gas that's far from the black hole that's moving relatively slowly, and that we see from the optical energy lines that are quite narrow. But then we have the gas that's closer to the black hole, it's closer to the radiation coming out of the corona, so it's ionized. 
But then the lines he seeks in the optical spectrum are broader by the Doppler gains as that gas moves in orbit around the black hole. So we kind of call these the broad line region and the narrow line. Fast ionized gas close to the black hole and the cooler, lower density, lower velocity gas that's further away. Those are terms that um, are used in, in optical spectra of AGM. Um, and then in X rays, we also see some of this gas because this gas absorbs the X rays that come back to one another. And a term that you might hear a warm absorbance. So warm means they're, they're slightly ionized and they're absorbing the, the X ray emission that we're seeing. And this is actually where the difference between a type one and a type two AGM come in. So that type one and that type two secret galaxy I talked about earlier. So here's that cartoon of an AGM. The type one AGM, or where we see these broad optical lines and the fast moving gas that's close to the black hole. And the picture is here that we're looking straight down the top. We're looking through the hole in the middle of the choice. So we can see the center. But in the type two AGM, we are only seeing the narrow emission lines. We're not seeing the broad emission lines for fast moving gas. So that this the fast moving gas, as we're over here, is close to the black hole. So as far as we're concerned, it's, it's hidden behind the torus. And then there's the blaze arms when we're looking straight down the jet. But this unification picture of AGM is, is much too simple, it turns out, in the gallery. Uh, because we know that not all AGM is the same. We can't explain all the differences just by looking at the same thing in different directions. We know that some AGM have jets, some don't. There's so many things of difference there. And we also find examples where um, we see type 2 AGM, but we don't see any torus, we don't see any oscillation. So, for whatever reason, just the fast moving gas isn't found. And we also see AGM that change between type 1 and type 2, uh, the fast moving broad line emitting gas. Changes and um, it comes and goes and it changes its intensity. And this can't be the torus changing its orientation with respect to us because the size of it can be because torus is a half x scale, so it would take much too long uh, for that to, uh, to change. Okay, so now I'm just going to talk through each of those components uh, in turn. Um, the first one is the accretion depth. Um, and I'm kind of going to gloss over a lot of the physics here, um, but I'll give you some, some references that, that, that might be interesting if you want to know more. And so the standard picture we have of the accretion disk dates back to a paper by Shapiro and Sanyaya in 1974, um, and then Novikov and Thorne in 1978-1979 did the same analysis, but including the full general relativistic treatment of the gravity. Um, but in this standard accretion disk, um, as I said before, we have material moving just in a stable orbit, uh, material just moving in orbit in a circle around the black hole. But if we follow Kepler's laws of motion, material at small radius must be moving faster than material at large radius. This means the inner radius of the disk is overtaking the outer radius of the disk. So the gas above the gap, we get friction. This friction dissipates energy, causing radiation we see. And this friction also transfers the angular momentum from the fast moving gas in the middle. It gives that angular momentum to the slow moving gas further around. And then when that gas loses its angular momentum, that's what lets it fall inwards. The angular momentum keeps it in orbit. The friction moves its angular momentum outwards, and that allows the gas to fall inwards. Unfortunately, it turns out that good old fashioned viscous friction and gas is blocked together is no way it's strong enough to get the gas to fall in the AGM at the speeds we need it to, to produce the bright light source we can see. So actually, we think that the, 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 the friction in these accreting discs comes from magnetic fields that end up getting tied to the knots when this gas is moving past each other. And this is something we call a magneto rotational instability. And then as this gas moves into the angular momentum, it gradually spirals into the black hole. And then it gets that in most stable orbits. It can't stay grounded in stable orbits anymore. So then when it moves its angular momentum there, it then goes on its plunging orbit and the density of the disk follows very rapidly. 
in terms of the electromagnetic emission we see from the occlusion disk, this comes from that bit of threat, from that threat, at least that magnetic equivalent threat that we're creating. We can easily calculate, so this goes back to the current and Light's paper, the temperature that the gas at each radius gets to based on the mass of the black hole and how quickly the gas is falling into the black hole. We can calculate the temperature that gas is heated to. And then because the disk is obviously thick, it falls into this equilibrium. It means that the um, the gas of each radius in the disk produces black body radiation. But each radius in the disk produces black body radiation at a different temperature. So the total spectrum that we see, so at each radius, the spectrum we see peaks at a frequency of um, 2.8 times the Boltzmann constant times the temperature. So we get a black body from each radius in the disk, from low energy up to high energy. And then we add this together over the whole disk. And the disk produces what we call this disk black body spectrum that's just the sum of all of these black bodies. From this equation up here, the temperature goes as mass to the minus one quarter. So this means that the bigger the black hole, the cooler the disk. So in an X ray binary, we might be able to see this black body in the X ray measure. But in an AGM, we're not really going to see this in the X-rays. All of this black body emission comes out in the ultraviolet and the optical wavelengths. It's also useful to think about the mass accretion rate. And if we have gas trying to fall into a black hole from all directions, we can write down this thing the Eddington ratio. But what happens is that gravity is pulling the gas in, but then we're producing this bright light source in the center. So radiation in fact is going to put the gas out again and stop it falling in. So if the gas is coming in from all directions, we end up with this theoretical maximum luminosity we can get to before we blow the gas as well. And this is called the Eddington limit or the Eddington luminosity. And we can convert that into a mass accretion rate if we just say that the, the mass that's falling into the black hole has an energy associated with it, mc squared. So if we have a mass rate falling into the black hole of m dot, the energy rate falling into the black hole is m dot and c squared. And then we're just going to multiply that by some efficiency factor we call eta. And that efficiency is the fraction of energy of the rest mass energy of the gas falling into the black hole that we're able to get out. If our black hole is not spinning, we can calculate this efficiency as somewhere about 6%. But if this black hole is maximally spinning, we can actually put this efficiency all the way up to 40%. Just because the disk can get closer to the black hole and we can get the radiation from that, that inner part of the disk. But that means that this Eddington luminosity, we can convert that into an Eddington mass flow rate. And then we define something called the Eddington ratio, which is the ratio of the rate at which gas is falling into the black hole to this Eddington limit, the theoretical maximum if the black hole is pulling in the gas directly. You can actually go faster than the Eddington limit. It's not, a, it's not a real limit. But our accretion of this actually changes depending on how quickly we're trying to push gas forward. So this picture that I talked about of having this thin accretion of this only actually works if our mass flow rate is somewhere between about 10 and 30% of the energy rate. Because in this range, what can happen is the, the gas can efficiently radiate, that means the disk can cool. And that lets it stay flat, lets it stay thin. If we try to put too much gas through the disks, if we go above about 30% of the eddies limits, we go up even to 90% of the eddies limits, 100% of the eddies limits, we can even go up to 120, 130, 200% of the eddies limits if we want, if we have a disk. What will happen is then we will produce so much radiation in the disk, it can't escape the disk. So then the disk becomes dominated by the pressure of the radiation it's producing, and then the disk puffed up with what we call a slim. 
The same thing kind of happens as well at very low mass species rates. If our gas is only falling in very slowly, the density. If the density of the gas is extremely low, yeah. Oh, we don't need the slide for this bit. But, um, so if the if the gas is extremely thin, kind of means black hole, we also have a thin gas doesn't cool yeah. critically by the radiation either. So if, if we have too low a mass of species rate, so below about 10% of the energy limits, then we also find that the disk can't cool. The gas stays hot. So again, we don't get this thin occlusion disk. We get this, this thick occlusion flow. And actually, this accretion flow is thick and it's radiatively inefficient. We sometimes call it a radiatively inefficient occlusion flow. It actually doesn't release much radiation at all. And the energy it has, it actually carries with it into the black hole. Um, so it advects the energy of the black hole. And another term for this is an advection dominated accretion flow or ADAF. But the, the kind of important thing for this is that we only get a thin accretion disk if we're in this regime of somewhere between 10% of energy and 30-ish percent. They're not hard limits. What will happen is if you go to a high the disk and gradually get there. But this is just a slide to say that, that what I've said is a vast level of interpretation and real accretion disks are very complicated. And then the state of the art we have in modeling accretion disks are these uh, simulations for general relativistic magnetohydrodynamics or radiation transfer of general relativistic magnetohydrodynamics, so RT, DR, MHD. Don't worry about that at all. What it means is RT, radiation transport, we follow the lights, we follow the heating. GR, general relativity. We have the gravity in the curved space around the black hole. And then MHD, magneto hydrodynamics. We have the gas, and we have its magnetic fields and its electric fields. We're putting everything together. And we end up with these very complicated tests. They're very turbulent. They're, um, there's all these uh, instabilities that develop. Actually, the, the disk going around in orbits with magnetic fields to it um, produces an electrical generator, a dynamo, and generates more magnetic fields. So maybe we could do the dynamo right now. Um, uh, but it's all of that complication that we think gives rise to the corona. And this corona is this region of particle acceleration very close to the black hole. So what happens is these uh, the cartoon which we have. Is we've got magnetic field lines that come off the disk and they also go through the black hole. They get twisted up as the disk goes round and as the black hole goes back. And then that releases energy and accelerates these particles in this corona. And they heat up to energies of hundreds of kilograms. And when we have this corona of hundreds of kiloelectron volts, hundreds of tens of particles. We get our thermal photons, our ultraviolet photons coming off the accretion disk. These photons go into the corona and they meet one of these high energy electrons. The low energy photon scatters off the high energy electron. That's called an inverse Compton scattering. And this photon can scatter multiple times off of multiple electrons. And when this inverse Compton scattering happens multiple times, it's a process we call. Optimization. This takes the ultraviolet photons from the disk, it transfers the energy from the corona into those photons, and it turns them into X ray photons. Contonization produces a spectrum that's quite boring. It's a power wall. So the fundamental X ray spectrum we expect to have in an AGM is a power wall. But the slope of that power how many low energy X rays we have versus how many high energy X rays we have depends on the temperature of the corona. I'm going to put some equations up that we don't need to worry about, but we can see that this, this power law index, this, this spectrum goes, the number of photons goes as energy to the minus gamma. Gamma is called the photon index, and you'll see that gamma or that photon index in X spec 
it's just a slope of the pearl of the number density of photons. This gamma we can calculate with these kind of unwieldy equations with a lot of approximations. But the most important things in here is that the, um, the temperature and the optical depth of the corona, the hotter the corona, the lower gamma, one over 10. So the hotter the corona, the lower the number of gamma. A lower gamma means that we have a flat set. We've got lots of high energy photons compared to lower photons. If the, if the corona is cooler, then we have a high gamma. That means we've got a steep spectrum, lots of low energy photons, few high energy photons. But then the temperature of our corona also puts a fundamental limit on how high our photon energy we get. We can't magically create energy. So the temperature of our corona also imposes a limit on the power law. And our power law will then cut off, and it will approximately form off as an exponential function above a temperature approximately k2, where t is the temperature of the corona. So we start with photons and including this, they come into the corona, they come to the scatter, and that gives us our cutoff power law spectrum. We can measure the temperature of the corona, and we can measure the size of the corona. These are results from New Star, uh, published by Andrew Fabian and Anne Lothin. And, and we find that actually all of our corona kind of sits in a narrow range of temperature versus compactness. So compactness is how small the corona is. Um, and this turns out to be quite interesting because the black solid line here that looks like it's the, the limiting temperature of our corona. We don't see any coronas really that are hotter than this black line. This line comes from theory that tells us that if we have a very compact corona that's very hot, it produces too many photons. The photons collide with each other to these electron positron pairs. And then those pairs getting produced take energy out of them. They limit the temp they limit the temperature of the corona. So it kind of works like a thermostat. The corona gets too hot, it will limit its own temperature by producing these pairs. And it looks like that theory makes sense here that the corona that we can measure with new star actually seems to obey this temperature limit. But of course, a big question is how exactly is corona hot? How do we get gas at hundreds of KV temperatures? Well, we can get to the clues from our simulation. So our MHD simulation is shown that our treating discs often produce these, these hot layers of thin gas above and below the disc, the magnetic fields in the disc and the gas. That's one possibility for the corona. We can also have magnetic field lines that are facing in opposite direction. It's magnetic field lines that go through the black hole, magnetic field lines coming off the disk. So if we have magnetic field lines meeting each other at points of the opposite directions, they undergo a process called reconnection. And that reconnection can also be said. So we can have hot gas coming off, off the top of the disk. We can have magnetic field lines getting tangled up, meeting each other and reconnecting around the black hole. Um, we could also have stuff happening at the base of our jets and um, have energy being dissipated at the sites the jets are being built from producing X rays. Um, and we can also have situations where our jets actually become unstable. And what starts off as a nice jet actually gets pushed over. And when the jet gets pushed over, and when we see this in some simulations that um, a student of ours at Stanford, um, well, a former student of ours, Yanchi Yuan, uh, ran, and when you put the jet over, there's too much magnetic field outside of it, it can put it over. This jet, when it gets put over, then it doesn't launch its energy out to large radius, but it dumps all of its energy into the region of the right down the black hole. And that's another mechanism that, that we could um, form to slow the by. But this is a very active area of research at the moment, trying to match these theories and predictions with our observations to try to better understand exactly how this, this corona works. So coming back to the accretion bits, we've now put this right corona, this corona producing X-ray right above the atoms. 
That means that the disc also ends up intersecting the X rays from the corona. These are the X rays from the corona shine onto the disc. And that means, as well as seeing the corona coming back to us, we can also see the X rays reflect off of the image of this. But we can see this when we look at AGN with XMM newtons. So, this is one of the longest observations we ever got with XMM. This is one and a half million seconds. Uh, this is um, about three or four weeks of continuous observing of uh, the Sefer galaxy with XMM. We can see in the spectrum, um, we have the power law. Um, so that's just the X-ray continuum coming from the corona. But then we also have these other features. We have this, this line up here, this line that has this broad redshift with windows of our energies. And we have this excess this soft excess of low energy X ray emission um, at low energies. And both of these features in the spectrum are produced when the X rays reflect off of the computers. And then we can also look at the high energy X rays. And actually, one of the best ways we can see this reflection is using New Star. And this is actually a kind of combined New Star. This is the new star, the new star observations of 18 different CFA galaxies all stacked on top of each other to, to add up all the photons from all of those AGN to, to see what the average spectrum of all of these AGN looks like. And in new star, we can see we've got that broad iron K line again that's reflected in the disk. And then we have this big hump up here at around 20 to 30 kV. And this is called the constant hump that's also when our X rays reflect off the occlusion disk. And, yep. um, and where this comes from is that when our X rays show down on this, our disk isn't like a mirror. It doesn't just reflect the X rays straight back to us. Our disk is this plasma around the black hole. So when the X rays interact with the plasma, they get reprocessed in a number of different ways. The simplest way that the, the process that closes to the simple reflection is quantum scattering. And that's the dominant process that produces a hump of 20 kV. But then other things can happen as well. Our X rays can be absorbed by the disk, they heat up the disk, and then that causes firm, more thermal emissions coming from the disk, mostly through a process known as Bremsstrahlung. And that Bremsstrahl on produces this kind of bump at low energies. And then here's the Compton hump at 20 kV as well. And then the atoms and the ions in our plasma can also absorb the photons by photoelectric absorption. X-ray photon goes in, it kicks an electron out of the atom, and then that leaves a vacancy in the atom. So then another electron higher up in the atom can fall down into that vacancy. And that's what we call fluorescent lighting. So we get Remstrahl on heating the disk, we get Compton scattering, we get absorption. So, like this dip here is this photoelectric absorption, mostly. So, this dip is either iron in the disk. And then we get these fluorescent emission lines that are produced at different energies by different ions in different chemical elements. The most prominent is this line here at 6.4 kV. This is called the iron K line. It's a very bright line that sits almost on its own in the spectrum, so it's very easy to see. And then we have a lot of low energy lines here. So these come, there's a line of iron here called the L line. There's also things like oxygen, nitrogen, and sulfur, all producing these, these different lines. Yes. Ah, so this is a spectrum from the theoretical model. Um, in units of um, EFE, so this is kind of like new F new in, in optical uh, spectrum. But where this where this spectrum comes from is we have a simulation. This was run by Javier Garcia. And actually, if you want to, to play with this spectrum yourself, you can load it next spec to a model from Zilla that um, Javier produced. Um, and, and what this simulation does is it has a slab of plasma kind of representing the plasma in the appreciates. And we shine X rays onto it with this power law spectrum that we expect. We let them do what they're going to do. They interact with the plasma in different ways, and then the plasma comes to an equilibrium. And then equilibrium 
you have then photons going in and then photons coming out. And this is the fact that photons coming out in that single way. And it's taking into account all these different kind of photons. Yes? What is the polar secret gas? Um, so we see this in super galaxy, but we can also apply this spectrum to any situation we have X rays reflecting off of optically thick gas. So we can apply this in X ray binaries. Um, Jeremy mentioned this as well yesterday. We can also apply this off of the surface of neutron stars. I'm uh, sorry, white dwarfs as well. Yes. The K line is more prominent. Um, it's to do with the, the atomic physics of iron. Um, iron has a, a very big cross section to absorb the photons. Uh, so it, it, it naturally produces a, a stronger line than many of the other elements. Yes. What is the lower part of the continuum? What is the lower part of the continuum? Uh, below, say, 1, 2, um, Do you mean this bit here? Yeah. Uh, to the left of it at lower energy, there seems to be a continuum kind of over which there are initial lines and absorption lines. Um, so the continuum here is coming from a couple of different things. So some of that is the confidence echoing, um, and some of that is the thermal emission and the brain star emission that's coming out of the jets. Um, so this is just the reflection spectrum, there's no primary. In the but then our uh, treating this is in orbits around the black hole. We'll talk about this tomorrow, but what we need to know for now is that when the, this material is in orbit, it's emitting this spectrum, but the orbit causes all of this emission to drop. Yeah, blue shifts and gas coming towards us, red shifts and gas coming away from us. We also have this gas in a strong gravitational field close to one hole. That produces another effect with gravitational effect. When a photon climbs out of the gravitational field, it also loses energy by the So there's an additional reflect, it's not just the doctor here, from the photons having to climb out of the gravitational field. We'll talk about this in detail tomorrow, but for now, putting all those effects together blurs out the effect, and it produces this broad iron K line that has this peak and then this broad redshift of wing, and that's the reflection of the gas that's closer to the black hole. And it kind of smears out all of those soft X ray emission lines into this soft X set, big pump in the low energy X ray spectrum. And if you want to play with this, this is an X ray model called Velzil that takes that silver spectrum of the reflection and applies this relative blurring. So I'm a little bit short on time. So what I want to do is just skip ahead to one last topic. Um, or oh, just to say, uh, before I do, um, the other thing that can happen is so we have our accretion disk that's producing that blurred and broadened reflection spectrum, but we also have that torus and those broad emission lines that are much further away from the black hole. They will also produce reflection, but they're not traveling quickly, they're not in orbit around the black hole, and they're not deep in the gravitational field. So often what we find if we look at this new star spectrum um, of all the secrets combined, we don't just see the um, the broad iron K line here. We see that on top of the broad iron K line, there's also this narrow line component as well. And you'll often find that in your HN spectrum that you need to account for both of these processes reflection off of the gas that's focused to the black hole, and also reflecting the gas that's much further away. The last thing I want to talk about in just a couple of minutes is um, absorption and gas that's outflowing. From, from our accretion disk. So what we'll find when we look at our X-ray spectrum is that, so the last spectrum I saw, we drew the power law on it, and we saw, we saw that our spectrum had bumps, it had excesses above the power law, the iron K line, the soft excess, and the Compton line. You also find in some AGM that you find dips. You find, so in NCD6, you can see around one K in there's this dip of emission below the panel. Um, and what I should say here is just with lower panels, what I've done is I've taken the spectrum and I've fitted a simple power law model to it. The model's wrong, it doesn't fit the data, but by dividing the data by this power law, the ratio between the, the, power, the, the data and the power law lets us see the features in the spectrum that sit there on top of the power law continuum. 
And we can see here in MCT6, we've got that nice broad iron K line. And in fact, MCT6 is the first that seems like that to discover this broad iron K line from the other disk. But you can see here, there's this big dip. We've got too little energy in that. We can't add an extra emission component here to produce this one. And then in this other galaxy, this is NGC 4151. This is much more extreme. And these dips come about because we've got gas, not in our galaxy, but in the other galaxies, in the AGM, around the black hole, that's absorbing the X-rays that pass through. It. And we often call these warm absorbers. And sometimes we need to put these into our model if we want to fully understand the, the spectrum. And um, so that's a very low resolution of these sorts using the CCDs on XM. But we could also use the RGS, the reflection gradient spectrum on XM. This gives us a high resolution spectrum of these AGM. Um, and this is um, a paper published last year by Daniele Robertini, who looked at the RGS observations of the galaxy called one to one. And we can see here that we don't just have those chunks cut out of the continuum spectrum. But when we use the RGS, we can see that our spectrum is full of these narrow absorption lines in different elements. And when you have these high resolution spectra of your absorbers, you can actually start to build models on them. We use photolionization models, models that predict how gases absorb and interact with the X rays that pass through them. Um, one we often use is a model from the X star, that's very useful for modeling AGM, or Cloudy is another example of one of these codes. Um, Cloudy and X star um, are codes that run outside of X star. And what you do is you have your model for what the continuum looks like, you run it through this code, and it produces an absorption spectrum tailored to your AGM. But using these models, we have parameters that, let, that we can fit to the data. That let us measure things like the density of these absorbers, the velocity of these absorbers, the ionization of these absorbers. And if we're clever, we can, if we've got good enough data, we can even measure things like the actual density of the gas instead of just the common density. <clears throat> we find that these absorbers are a little bit complex. You can't just use one model, one photo We find that we have to have multiple models. Of gas that's in different sets, different things. We often find that we have gas traveling at different velocities. We have gas at different ionization states. We have low ionization gas and high ionization gas at different densities. And the picture that we draw from that is that we don't have a smooth outflow, but this outflow of gas coming from our AGM is clumped. We have dense clumps, we have lighter clumps. Um, and these warm absorbers change the slightness. The AGM changes, the luminosity changes, these absorbers change in quite complicated ways. So we're starting to get this picture of clumps of gas that are outflowing from the accretion disk. And you can see here that, so here's the data, and here we have this model, in fact, these three different models of three different populations of absorbent gas that we need to, to explain in the high resolution spectrum here. Let's say these X star and these cloud models, we use them to tailor the, the spectrum to our sophisticated gap. But sometimes we just need a quick look at what the absorbers do. And X spec also has a model called Warmax that lets us not pre-calculate these models, it lets us do it on the fly. But the warning I'll give you with Warmax is that it is often extremely slow and it will make your fits take a very long time. So uh, use it sparingly. Um, but yes, if you, if you want to know more about warm absorbers, I'd be, be happy to talk about them. Yes. Just like, uh, I'm wondering if uh, that's a problem. Sorry, I'm wondering if that's about the residue was there. Yes. And we able to think of absorption in lines and emission lines where they are really not into absorption lines. Um, so why do we only have the absorption lines in here? Um, the, 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 the simple answer is because the emission lines are very complex. And so the, the simple model we have just has these, um, these absorption lines in. 
Um, and the absorption is easy at the moment because what we're looking at is with a single line of sight for the black holes. So we're just seeing gas spectrums on our lines. To model the absorb the, the emission of the gas, yes. you actually need to account for all of the clumpy gas that's all around the black hole that's able to, to scatter the lines into, into one direction. So, yes, if you can measure the, the emission component as well, you can actually get a lot more than that. In this case, you obviously can do that. Um, yeah. And then you can see here that just as you change the column density of these absorbers, it's how it's spectrum. So this is the transmission. If you're at 10 to the 20 or 10 to the 21 percent of the square column densities, most of what it does is just put lines into your top X-ray spectrum and it takes a little bit out of your lower energy X-ray continuum. But once we get up to column density 10 to the 22, you can see here it's not just putting lines in the spectrum, but it really is biting a chunk out of the continuum spectrum. And as the column density gets higher, you can see that we're even getting absorption up at around three, four, five AUV. So when the absorption gets up to 10 to 22, 10 to 23, it's not just these interesting lines as well. So if you want to know about things like the collection of the disk, then you really have to be careful with your, your understanding of the source. And then at 10 to the 24, we become what's called Compton fixed, so optically fixed, Compton scattering. And at this column density, the, the low energy emission you get from AGN that we see in XMM almost entirely disappears. But the high energies um, that we can see with NuSTAR can pass through that gas. So, um, so NuSTAR is often good for, for seeing some of the absorbers. And then related to these absorbers, <laughs> these, these last cases of outflows that we call ultra fast. Um, so the, the warm absorber sections fact, were traveling maybe at a couple of thousand kilometers per second. Um, and these are this is gas that's ionized, but it's not too ionized. So we get lots and lots of absorption lines at low energies. These ultra fast satellites, we call them, or UFOs, what, um, that's a, a name that kind of stuck a while ago, and so I don't really uh, call them that to the conference. Um, these UFOs um, are a little bit different to the, um, the warm absorbers. So there, there's two things to know about. The first thing about them is that they're very highly ionized. So we don't see anything really, you know, we see a little bit in the lower energy experts. But where these really pop out is we see absorption lines up at 6 V from ionized iron. So this is helium like and hydrogen like iron. Iron that's lost almost all of its electrons. And if we look at these, the way these appear in our spectrum is so, so here's a, a spectrum here in blue. And then the red line here shows if we ignore this ultra fast outflow and we just model the iron K line and the X ray continuum. And we see that there's this big dip here that we can zoom in on here at about eight to nine K. Now, an iron absorption line typically has an energy of around 7 k. For us to be able to see this at 9 k, that means it needs to be pollution. So whatever gas is producing this absorption line must be found in the And to shift the 7 k line to 9 k, you need this gas to be moving at a velocity, in this case, 0.24 times the speed of light. So ultra-fast outflows are highly ionized gas that's traveling at a mildly relative speed. It's not like a jet that's traveling at 99% of the light, but we've got this gas that's coming out at 10, 20, 30% of the speed of light. We can estimate where this comes from around the black hole by comparing this velocity to the escape velocity of the equation. And we find that this 0.24c is the escape velocity within the inner parts of the universe, somewhere between tens and maybe a hundred half So this is gas that's being ejected from the inner parts of the accretion up to speeds of about 20% of the speed of light. This could be driven just by simple radiation effect of putting the gas, or it could also be driven by magnetic. 
If you have a magnetic field line on a collision disk with the whole ground, if, you, if that magnetic field line is pointing outwards away from the black hole, just like when you drive around the corner of the car, you get thrown to the outside of the car, you know, which you pass, these magnetic field lines get thrown out. And then if you have this magnetic field line pointing outwards, spinning around, it can carry the material off the collision disk and accelerate it to these things that we see. So these ultrafast outflows could be driven by this magnetic process that we call the Blanca Pain process. And these UFOs are extremely powerful things. We can measure the velocity of these UFOs. Oh, yes. Uh, can you go back to the last slide? So iron uh, 25, 26, uh, 6 and 6.7 and 6.9 AVN. Right? Yes, that's right. Uh, so uh, like, I have a couple of questions. First is like, how do you identify them as iron 7 or like iron 25? Because it can be some other absorption like a country. <laughs> And uh, can the origin be some type of around cutting feature also, or uh, like I'm just curious how how do you exactly know that it is iron uh, like twenty five twenty six absorption? Yeah, good question. So actually, the the um the way we do this is um so the way you might be part of this is uh, there's two ways you can do it. The first one is the bar you say if it's iron twenty six point nine kV, then this is the velocity. We can calculate the velocity of the bars. Um, but we can also look at the spectrum and we can compare the spectrum to photoionization models. So, what we do is we can run photoionization models at different ionization levels um, and we, we match those to the features we see in the spectrum. And we see that the lines that we get best match the photoionization models for the high ionization gas, in which case it could be the, the ion 26 or 25. If um, yeah, if it was different gas, if it was different ionization states of gas, then you'd expect to see other absorption lines. You know, you'd, so if you were low ionization, you'd expect to see the neutral of the trans five and the twenty six lines, uh, and we don't see that. And, and I said that we don't really see these in the soft X-ray band. That's not entirely true. We do produce some of the small absorption lines in the soft X-ray band. And actually, um, so this was Michael Parker's paper. And when he was working with us, Piro Pinto uh, did the RGS analysis for this, uh, this same source. And actually, in the RGS, we see the normal warm absorber lines, but then we see some other lines as well in the same velocities. And then that lets us say this is the photoionization model. So then this is what we expect to be uh, the eye So this is one of the most extreme one of these yeah, on this one. Um, so this is one of the most extreme cases of these um, these ultrafast outflows this is a quaver called pds456 and here actually going back to the question earlier we don't just see the absorption line here we also see the emission line here. so we have this gel of gas that's coming out of the coming out of the collision disk the line of sight that we have is producing this blue gifted absorption from the gas coming towards us, but then we also see the red shifted and the, and the unshifted emission that's coming from the other side of the planet. So Spike that's moving away from us is producing the red shifted emission. So in this case, we have what's called a P-signy profile. This P-signy profile is absorbed going along the line of sight, it's blue shifted on top of emission from all the pressure. Uh, so we've got broad emission and blue shifted absorption. And what we can do is we can calculate from the velocity of this gas and the, the depth of these lines and the density of this gas, we can calculate the um, outflow rates here. And we find that um, we get about 10 solar masses per year of gas coming out of this AGN. Um, and just with um, kinetic energy as a half m squared, we find that the kinetic energy in this wind is something like 10 to the 46 Earths per second. That's something like 20% of the total power output of this AGN is coming out in the kinetic energy of these winds. And this is telling us that the ultrafast outflows might be another way that, um, <coughs> that our AGN are injecting energy into our host galaxies and driving this process with AGN. High velocity winds, a lot of energy, lots of momentum into the stellar medium of the galaxy. 
Um, so this is kind of my summary for today, <laughs> that these multi-wavelength observations of AGM are letting us piece together the structure. We have the accretion disk, we have the corona that's producing the X-ray continuum, and then we have this whole manner of different outflow and streams, the lower velocity warm absorbers that absorb in the X-ray spectrum. And then in many cases, we have these ultra-fast outflows traveling at 20 to 30 percent of the speed of light. And these ultra-fast outflows, as you can get the radiation coming from AGM, is releasing enormous amounts of energy that means these supermassive black holes must have played an important role in the formation of galaxies outside the uh, universe. And so I'll stop there um, and maybe take a question or two while the next super setting up one. Um, <laughs> <laughs> oh, uh, uh, but if not, uh, we can chat in the top later. Okay. What is the mechanism of uh, creating nano spinning black holes? We know that from uh, the conservation of uh, angular momentum is the product object must uh, speed faster than the original object. Yeah, so there's different, so we'll come back to this in the next lecture, but um, yeah, there's, there's different ways you can produce. So we expect black holes to be spinning, when right? gas falls into the black hole, the angular momentum should go in, the next faster. You can have a non-spinning black hole. Either one way is if the black hole is spinning in this direction, and then it starts creating gas from the other direction. If the if it, the creating is chaotic and coming in different directions, that will mean the black hole will tend to spin down as well. Um, the other thing that can happen is when galaxies merge, the supermassive black holes in the center of the galaxy can merge. So then, if you have black holes spinning in opposite directions that merge with each other. Then the result is love. So I, I have a proposal for all those who have questions. There are still a lot of questions after such uh, extraordinary.